Welcome to the London Ambulance Trust Board meeting in public on May the 25th. Uh, there are a number of uh, board members joining us remotely. Uh, the rest of us are in the room. And welcome to those of you who are watching the live streaming on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, to begin, I would like to welcome back Tricia Bain, who's come back to us as Interim Director of Corporate Governance. We're very grateful to you, Tricia, for stepping into the breach. And a warm welcome to Anne Rainsbury, who's a new board member who will be taking over from Jane Mee. So welcome to Anne. And Anne comes with a broad background in understanding healthcare in London, HR and OD change. So very welcome to follow on from Jane Mee. And this is Jane's last meeting. And I'm going to do my thanks now, Jane, because if we run out of time, I don't want to run out of time to say thank you for your considerable contribution while you've been here at LAS, in particular in your role with the People and Culture Committee and helping us work through our manpower planning and workforce and the issues you've done in relation to well-being. Uh, you've made a great contribution and we will miss you, but we wish you all the best in your new interim role as chair of the Bristol Trust. So congratulations on that, and we look forward to keeping in contact with you, but you will be missed. Thank you. So um, I don't think we have any um, apologies for absence, so that takes me to declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest that need to be declared today. I'll take that as a no, thank you. And if we could turn to the minutes of the meeting on the 30th of March. And if I could ask, are there any matters of correction um, going through page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. I think it shows what thorough minutes we have that we're so long. Uh, if there are no um, corrections, can we take those as a correct record of the meeting, please? Yes, some nods. Nobody declined, so yes, we will do that. Thank you. That then takes us to um, matters arising, and there are a few. So turning to those, the first one is NHS 111 services. Kadir, do you just want to speak to that? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think there's been a number of discussions at a number of forums uh, with regards to our 111 services, how they fit within the context of uh, our overarching strategy and within the wider context within the NHS in London and kind of national policy direction in relation to integrated urgent care services. Uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, uh, we prepared a paper, the executive prepared a paper and presented that to the Finance and Investment Committee on the overarching kind of, approach to integrated urgent care services uh, for the LAS, where we currently are, where we are, uh, where we are looking to go and how we're currently uh, developing and delivering those services. Uh, the one action from that meeting was to now uh, look to commission uh, the lean review, which is something that uh, I know uh, non-executive colleagues, specifically Romal, have, have asked to do. So I think the next job really is to develop that specification and look to agree at, at, uh, at a board subcommittee level before we look to commission that work. Um, Kadir, for members of the public who may be listening or indeed staff, what is a lean review? Uh, a lean review is, is to, to look at the overall efficiency of the service, to, to demonstrate that we are delivering good value for money alongside the best kind of patient outcomes. So it's to take uh, uh, the service that we provide from the point at which we take a call to the point at which uh, that, uh, that uh, kind of uh, uh, patient or, or, or member of the public has received a definitive, uh, definitive uh, care uh, and to demonstrate that we're delivering it in the most efficient and, uh, 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 and uh, most efficient way. So it's to demonstrate value for money uh, alongside best patient outcomes. Thank you. Any questions for Kadir on that before we just move on? It's something that's been running for some time and it's very important to our strategic future. No, so my question is just about timeline for completing that, as you know. <clears throat> 
fair, the fair challenge to chair. Can I ask a <coughs> uh, Perhaps outside of here, I take it offline with uh, uh, exec colleagues and some of our uh, uh, interested NED colleagues uh, to agree the specification and then the timeline. I think what's important is that we do this well. Uh, so just to share, my experience of... Um, lean is that it does take a few months to do it properly but we do need to have a definitive answer because if we're going to take on any more one on one services we will want to know that answer before I think the board will be prepared to take that decision. Can I, can I suggest Chair that we have uh, it's concluded by uh, so I think in three months so concluded by September recognising August. Do you think that's realistic Lorraine? I think that's okay. Yes. Okay thank you good so moving on clinical presentations Fenella do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, so we've been working through um, a programme looking at some of the clinical innovations that we've done um, over the last year, both combined with stakeholders across London to improve care for patients and internally, and we'll be bringing those forward uh, to the board uh, going forward, uh, in particular looking at the innovative stroke pathway in north central London and the clot busting drug that our advanced paramedics critical care are delivering um, for patients who may have a pulmonary embolus, which is a clot in the lung, which can be life-threatening. I think that would be really very good to do. So that's good. Okay, excellent. And moving on, um, John and um, Garrett. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be attending the patient public forum on the 6th of August to present on how, as clinicians, we make conveyancing decisions. Okay, so this is about quite a lot of our in perceived incidents about non-conveyance, when in fact non-conveyance can be exactly the right thing the right to do, and we should be reducing conveyance to hospital. So the more public involvement we have in that, the better. So great, thank you. Um, international staff working and visas, are you taking that, Garrett? I will take that, yes. Um, Chair, so we did uh, contact the Home Office following discussion at... Uh, the uh, March board meeting and uh, we have recently re received a response from them uh, around uh, the options available which are largely as set out in their public guidance um, which allows um, staff to take up to four weeks unpaid leave in addition to paid leave uh, without losing their sponsorship. Uh, we are obviously working with uh, in both individually and collectively with our international paramedic community uh, to make sure that uh, they, they have, they're aware and they take advantage of the various options that are available, including the, the up to one year extensions uh, on current <coughs> visas uh, and uh, looking to uh, understand more long term the uh, intentions of our international paramedic community with a current survey ongoing uh, around uh, likely preferences uh, in terms of staying on for longer or, or, or going home. That, that work's still in progress, but at the moment uh, we don't anticipate uh, an immediate um, uh, sort of exodus. However, I think we recognise that there is a long term risk uh, around not only uh, you know, international paramedics uh, eventually deciding they want to return home, but also whether the same uh, you know, supply of uh, international paramedics will be available in the future. And all of that is being fed into our workforce uh, planning strategy, uh, which uh, John uh, has now taken over from Kadir in leading. Uh, and that uh, includes, uh, I think for this reason and for other reasons, uh, an anticipated significant ramping up in uh, the, uh, the size and scale of our paramedic pathway, development pathway, uh, over the coming 12 to 18 months. So I think that um, the pandemic has meant that a lot of people are re-evaluating their life and we would be unwise yeah. to underestimate yeah. the impact that yeah. would have on us. But thank you. And uh, you've just covered the next item. So now John, as Chief Paramedic and Quality Officer, will take over the mm. development programme for Workforce. Yeah, thank you. Um, D999 Workshop, uh, now then. So this is going to be now taken forward to the strategy team. Um, Sheila, did you want to comment on this? Um, yeah, I can, Chair. Um, so I think this is related to, um, we've received a, a, a recommendation from one of our PwC reviews uh, for D999, and they were 
uh, recommending that we create a more integrated change management roadmap for all of our transformation programs, not just the D999 programs. So I think this is what, uh, this may have come up as part of that conversation uh, at the last meeting. Uh, I just want to say that it has come up again at the Logistics and Infrastructure uh, Committee meeting last week, and I'll cover a little bit more about that uh, when I do my okay. report. Thank you. But I do think there's a real opportunity here for us to look at creating more integrated um, change roadmaps so we can understand what all the change impacts are across all of our transformation programs and then what mitigations and um, support and resources we might need to put in place to address all of those. Okay. Uh, so I think that's what it's related to. to yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Does anybody want to come back on that? It will come up, as we say in Sheila's report, and probably comes back in the whole culture and transformation, how they link together and indeed link to lean and communication, big issue, Anthony, for all of that. Okay, CIPs. Um, now, I didn't receive this, so I was just saying this morning, and I just can I clarify, did other non-execs get the CIPs by correspondence? I think that is an outstanding issue, which is very important. It's not been made available to non exec, so if that could be corrected, please. And the resolution framework, an update on that. Kim, are you on the line? No, she is. No, okay, you're doing it then, are you? Value where she is at the moment, actually. Um, can I go into I don't have an update okay, on that. Okay, so we can carry that forward. Here, but uh, yeah. I'm just testing. I think there's been some confusion. Uh, We'll um, Jane, perhaps as your outgoing message, what was your understanding of non-exec uh, involvement in uh, the resolution framework, so we can be clear what your thinking was? I think that that was more about um, how appeals will be yes. handled going forward. Um, and there was a proposal in the resolution framework that said that it would be dealt with by executive directors uh, and the exec in future, rather than non-executive directors hearing appeals for dismissal. Um, and that was the way that the framework was suggesting um, that, that we should go. So I think that was what that was referring to. So just to be clear, that non-exec's only involvement would be in appeals against dismissal? Uh, well, no, the, the, the recommendation was that non-execs should not be involved at that stage. Well, in my, I don't know, and my experience is that non-execs are always involved in appeals against dismissal because it, you're ending potentially somebody's livelihood, which is why it needs that level of independence. And what's your view? Yeah, that would be certainly my view. I've not ever come across, because normally... This lesson is reserved to either, you know, a board member who's a member of the executive, so effectively a, an appeal is challenging that executive yeah. requires non-executive oversight, with, with my understanding. So can we take that offline and look at that and come back? That is, that is normal experience that in was, the NHS. That was the action was to take I, it. Offline and to bring it back. So it seems we haven't actually moved forward with it. So if we could move forward, it is important from an employee perspective um, of making sure we are um, challenging executive decisions. Because as I say, you can be taking people's livelihoods away, and we cannot take our uh, duties lightly. But Jane, is that at cross purposes to your thinking? Um, yeah, that, that isn't my experience. So, um, okay. In, in so. <laughs> okay, so we will pick that up offline, but thank you, right? Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, so I think that takes us on then to the Chair's My Report, which is there for assurance. And I have just noted what we agreed at the Board Development Day, because I think if this is a meeting in public, it's useful to share that, that, um, as you all know, we had an, up, an external facilitator, Mike Farrow, who's a very experienced very senior um, NHS uh, leader who is now working independently and leads the non-exec development of Price Waterhouse and other consultancy work. Um, it was very helpful that the exec shared uh, their portfolio and their understanding of the ambulance operation modernisation business case and the six um, transformation programme work to enable us to deliver the strategy and transform our service. 
I think we, we discussed many things and it was a very helpful day, but um, we agreed that the three strategic aims remained as set out in my paper in 1.3. Um, and we came to the conclusion that the ambulance operation model was determined to be a proof of concept, setting out how mo modernization of fleet and vehicles would lead to modernization of the service and they be economic for the health economy. Um, but given the constraints of capital, we needed to seek alternative sources of funding, particularly through the digital and green agenda. Um, and we took three particular strands of work forward at that stage. One was the importance of co-production, uh, to use Mark's words, uh, with staff about describing what this change is all about. And we asked Fenella and John to work with Mark and Karim in particular to update us on that, which we will do at the next board development day, to look at the interdependence of the projects and our capacity and capability to deliver them all and the business cases, as well as business as usual, and how we're going to monitor it. And that, you know, we have a lot of work going on, as you've seen with all the business cases we've had. How do we do all of that and assure ourselves we've got the right processes in place? And that, in turn, will make us look at our assurance committees, which we've committed to do, and what the board then does. And um, Sheila and Rob will agree to work with, um, I think, Garrett on that. Is that my recollection? Yes? Yes, I, I think that was, was there our capacity and capability yes. to uh, to deliver an ambitious transformation program. So yeah, we have a, a session, I believe, in the diary, but we have yet to meet to discuss that specifically. So that if that could be done in the next month, that would be helpful. And then we agreed on a strategy refresh, and um, that is something that Amit agreed to do, working with Angela and Garrett. And we have made some further progress on that, and it's reported in my report. So that's good, so thank you. Okay, but the um, importance of staff involvement early on cannot be underestimated and getting that communication strategy uh, right the way through everything that we do. So that takes me on to the staff and volunteer chairs advisory group. And I just, this is a group that um, is very keen to chat with me. And uh, actually I want feedback to the executive that there's some very positive feedback to you all, particularly on the agreement about the wellbeing day. Um, but continued focus needs to be made on the perceived failures of equity, culture and transparency. And um, these really relate to our staff survey and how we make some significant changes. And the other link of the staff groups that I've done with the female executives, with Garrett's um, following Garrett's letter to staff after Sarah Everard, is to meet with women of the service. And, and again, they've been very fruitful conversations, very positive. But the two issues are about safety, which I would say is not gender specific, but looking at our ambulance hub sites going forward is going to be extremely important. And then those things that um, could be described as inappropriate behavior towards women. and. Um, that is being taken forward by two of our senior paramedic, or senior paramedic and um, associate director strategy with the wider leadership group and Garrett and feeding back to them for management action. And I think that um, those groups are very fruitful. And we will be hearing a little bit more about that later in the day. And Exactly, so that's good. A number of external meetings, they don't go away. They're mostly in relation to the ICS formation working with ACE and the Confederation on um, how best to present the Ambulance Trust position in relation to how we move forward. And I think there is significant progress that there's a, an agreed position with ACE that um, all Ambulance Trusts would have a preferred position of not being um, accountable to, through one ICS in their region, but to have a regional board, and Lorraine has been party to some of those conversations too, because there's a, a recognition that in capital, ambulance trusts are likely to suffer, commissioning because people don't know the expertise. And the thing that moves it forward from my perspective is the suggestion is there should be a lay chair. I think it's still suboptimal to what we as a London Trust 
ambulance trust have put forward in our response to the white paper, which is that we should be a six ICO or ICS. But it is quite a lot of progress. Um, and separately, Garrett and I have met with Chris Hobson of the NHS providers to talk about how he also might help in addressing those issues. Um, last Friday, just hot off the press, a Secretary of State visited our trust to talk to a member of staff about wellbeing and Garrett and I had 10 minutes with him and we're providing a note for him on what we see as the best position and what the opportunities are out there, particularly around urgent care pathways and how trust should be set. So it takes up, I, it's not a complaint, but you'd be surprised how many of these meetings there are. And then the ICS meetings and the London Regional Chairs meeting and the agenda there is mostly about uh, elective reset immunisations, cancer and well-being. And well-being does need to be a main focus. So I, is there any questions I can answer those? I shall take that as a no. Uh, thank you. Noted. And we move on to Garrett's report. Thank you, Item Chair. Item six. Um, I think I'll take my report largely uh, as presented. Uh, it touches on some of the issues that, that Heather's obviously referred to. Um, I tried to provide a bit of a high-level overview, given that this is the May meeting uh, and we're considering later in the, um, later in the uh, agenda the annual uh, report and governance statement, just a general review of what's obviously been a pretty remarkable year. Uh, it's covered in more detail in uh, Kadir's report in terms of the operational performance of the Trust uh, and provide a little bit more detail on the work that's gone on around the strategy refresh that Heather's already referred to and the work that I'm uh, picking up with uh, Amit uh, and, and Angela as Associate Director of Strategy. Uh, and I think you know, the recognition that we, we had in that early work is that this is, this is about both the overarching strategy refresh and also a reshaping of our enabling strategies so that they more directly correlate to um, the vision of where we're going in transformation terms uh, and that we are able to cross-reference them with a number of uh, cross-cutting themes around quality, around environmental agenda, uh, around uh, communications, both internally and externally, uh, across the organisation, uh, and so on. So there is a deal of work to do there, and we're busy working up a programme of prioritisation to do that work in, which we anticipate bringing to you in due course. Uh, apart from that, I think, as I say, the rest of the items are pretty much as uh, as written, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you. Questions for Garrett. Um, Sheila. Gareth, and not so much in your report, but um, I think it's probably an appropriate time to ask the question. I mean, obviously, we've all been following in the news the, um, the cyber ransomware attack on the Irish Health Service. And I know we had a, a discussion recently about, you know, promoting greater cyber culture awareness across the trust to make sure that because these things often happen by somebody clicking on a link. It's not so much the technology infrastructure component that's um, is the cause of the of the crash. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, has the exec had a conversation following uh, that attack, and are there any other measures that uh, we need to put in place uh, to make sure that we're fully protected um, should we, you know, be targeted again in the future? It's a very good question, Sheila. I'm going to defer to my Chief Operating Officer, who has obviously has responsibility for uh, our IT and cyber agenda. Uh, thank you, thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Sheila, for the question. Oh, so, so sorry, just one, one interjection. I mean, I don't see this as an IT matter. No. Uh, I see this as a, a sort of cultural awareness matter, so I just wanna, um, I just wanna underline that point. I think that's right, Sheila, yeah. Okay. Let's hear what Kadir has to say and then come back. Uh, thank you, Sheila. So um, I think um, uh, we are aware of it as a trust. Uh, uh, Sheila and I spoke uh, when, uh, when the news broke of the challenges uh, to the Irish Health Service. Um, I've been working with Barry uh, Thurston, our interim CIO, who's been in touch with NHS England generally, just to understand the general context of what broke and ensure that both the NHS and, uh, uh, and, and specifically the LAS uh, understood and had actions in place to mitigate or, or assure ourselves that we were not vulnerable. So on a, in, in relation to the specific challenges of, of uh, the, uh, the incident in the Irish Health Service, I think we've got some assurance that uh, we don't anticipate it to have a, a, an impact on us. 
Um, in terms of the broader, broader point, Sheila, I think it's a fair challenge, and I, I think we haven't had uh, the broader conversation um, in relation to uh, in relation to cyber awareness, cyber security uh, uh, across the trust in general terms for some time, and it's possibly uh, uh, time that we revisited that. Um, so perhaps between this board and the next, we can come back to you with some assurance as to how we're raising the general awareness uh, and just ensuring that. Uh, the organisation generally is, is literate and understands some of the challenges and that we are making sure that we are uh, assuring ourselves of that. Okay. Anne, you wanted to come in. It was, it was only to say, I mean, just obviously that is learning from the WannaCry um, cyber attack, which happened sort of uh, five years ago now, I think. Um, and the big issue there, which was also a significant issue at the LAS at the time, was the culture of not patching. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess the assurance idea would be that, that ha ha people have learned from that attack and that, that there is regular patching. Mm. I think there is. I'm going to Jill and then let's yeah. get Kadir to answer that. Jill. No, I was just going to say that um, you know, at GSK, we've, you know, cyber attacks have been a, a real challenge for us and quite an issue. And we have a lot of field based employees. Um, mm -hmm. So I think I, it might be useful if I share some of the learnings of how we've been tackling that. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Jill. Kadir, are we regularly patching? Uh, and so how I, do you know? Yes, yeah, so uh, I worked with Anne. I was the Chief Operating Officer for the London NHS during WannaCry. And so rem remember the pain of it well. Um, as we came into, as I came into the LAS uh, some 18 months ago, patching was a challenge, wasn't it? Uh, but uh, and one of the challenges that we had as an organisation was our infrastructure was quite uh, was legacy infrastructure, so our, our ability to patch in a timely way uh, was constrained. Um, uh, I'm not aware that we have any issues in relation to patching at present. Um, well, and maybe so that's we something you go through the um, lick to confirm as assurance. But I think the point that's being raised is this is a communication to all staff, and so perhaps the executive with Anthony can talk about how you're best going to do that. It's broad awareness. Um, Karen. Uh, no, I just wanted to, I think, highlight Sheila's point actually is that most of these are from employees clicking on links that are sent yes. through to them. And so it very much is a culture thing and sits wider than IT and probably does need a put. Hackney is the latest. Pardon? Hackney Council is, yes. is oh, the yes. latest one that's just suffered a terrible yes. um, wiping yeah. all their record, there, records. There's, there's, a, there's a cartel now that's, that's, you know, it's a very sophisticated these days. So when it is much more about tricking employees and less about, you know, the patching and the regime, that has to be kept up to date. But and that's why I'm really wanting to emphasize the point around cultural awareness. Yes engaging with our employees, helping them to understand how to remain safe, particularly in these times when we're working remotely. Yes. You can easily be tricked into something. Yes. Uh, and I just think it's, you know, if, if ever there was a time to highlight it, now is the time, particularly because of this situation in Ireland, which has been in the news every day. Yeah. And what probably staff will relate to more is something like, just to get their attention, the Royal Mail issue of pay a pound and we we'll deliver your parcel, which is... You know that because they probably won't quite relate necessarily to another health service, but they will relate to something that's personal to their home. Because what we're trying to say is they need to have attention to it in all facets of their life. But that's a really helpful um, contribution. Thank you. Okay, anything else on Garrett's report? No. Let us move on then. So um, thank you. We note your report. Thank you. So, moving on to your report, Kadir, as Chief Operating Officer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I think I'll take the report as read and, and take any questions, but really split into uh, uh, three or four areas, which was uh, maintaining resilience, so making sure that we continue to learn from wave one, wave two. We work with our system partners, both NHSE and I, our ICS colleagues and our emergency services to continue to uh, maintain resilience, build resilience. Uh, and take learning. Second piece is obviously our journey towards recovery, just making sure we are thinking about our staff within the context of, uh, of the year that they've had, making sure that I've got the right leadership teams in the relevant directorates to, uh, to deliver efficient operational services um, and that we've got the right governance in place to support that. 
uh, uh, and then the final piece is just continue to remain focused on the broader infrastructure and estate transformation in your delivery of that transformation programme and, uh, and just uh, providing an update on where we are in relation to that. But happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions for Kadir, Jane, and then Rommel. Thank you, Heather. Um, you mentioned uh, on, in your report, at uh, page four, about the agile working policy and proposed changes to ways of working. And, uh, and it might be a question for you, it might be a question for Kim, I'm not sure. What percentage of our people who've been working from home wish to return on both a full-time and part-time basis and how are we going to accommodate that? Uh, uh, thank you for the question, Jane. I don't have those figures at hand, I have to be honest. Um, so we've, the, the, the ways of working work has been split into two parts. One, an agile working policy that our people and culture colleagues and Kim Nurse has led and, uh, and then um, how we might operationalise that, uh, which is work that Andrew Goodman, uh, my interim director of strategic assets and property, has been leading. Uh, so those two parts have come together now. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, we've discussed it as an executive group, and the next stage is to think through how we uh, discuss the implications of those policies with our relevant directorates and think about how we communicate as an organisation. We are looking to move to... Um, uh, uh, the feedback that we've had from staff in relation to agile working is, um, is uh, uh, although the year has been incredibly testing and the majority of our corporate staff have worked from home, um, uh, many have expressed a desire to come back to work, but to maintain mm -hmm. some of that agility and some of that flexibility. So, oh dear. Sorry, I was thinking, would it be worth Garrett just when you finish adding a few bits on that? Or, sorry, I didn't mean to cut across you. <laughs> Kim, I think, was on the call, but she seems to have dropped off. She's back there. Um, I, we did do some survey work on this, uh, and uh, I think from memory, Kim may have some more detailed numbers, but we were talking about 80% of staff uh, who've been working from home expressing the desire to continue to work from home, not necessarily on a full-time basis, but more likely on typically a two- to three-day basis. On that uh, on that basis, that, that's why we, we, we're developing a, a revised... Uh, you know, flexible working and also accommodation strategy around corporate office accommodation uh, based around a, a one to two uh, uh, model uh, of, of, of desk occupancy, i.e. we will provide one desk for every two employees uh, 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 proportioned across the uh, the corporate office based directorates uh, and that's the work that, that Kadir's referring to uh, working up. Um, so we're looking to move towards that relatively rapidly. It has to dovetail in with our slightly longer term uh, agenda, which is around consolidation of corporate central London office space into Waterloo only. If you recall, we've gone in the last couple of years from four uh, central London offices down to two, being Waterloo and Pocock Street. Uh, Pocock Street leases up June 2022. Uh, and uh, the objective is that by that time, we are able to uh, accommodate all those that need to be in central London, which will, of course, be considerably fewer, uh, both from a more flexible, agile working perspective and also uh, from the perspective of making more use of our non-central London office space in some of our other locations uh, more flexibly, which staff have uh, indicated a, a, a willingness and indeed enthusiasm to do. Um, I think the thing, the cultural thing that we really have to get to grips with that we are uh, discussing and debating amongst the executive is uh, how we reorganize the working sort of environment and the ways of working when we want or when we need people to be in the office, what types of meetings are best done uh, face to face and what types of meetings uh, can be effectively done uh, remotely in the way that we've had to do over the last 12 months um, and, uh, and, and, and generally start to get to grips with, you know, what is, what is the future going forward for, for, for office-based slash non-office-based corporate working uh, and what does that look like? How do we optimise both the work-life uh, balance and the working experience for employees but also actually get more uh, value out of the, uh, the time that our, our staff give to us and, the, and the, obviously the expensive office space that we use uh, to do that when we do it physically in person? So there's quite a bit of work going on uh, and from a you know, my personal perspective is I think it will take us a while to get that right. This seems to me to be probably the biggest cultural change in office-based working since 
probably email came in in the late 1990s and so on, uh, and we're still learning. So, Jane, I don't know if you wanted to address or um, the softer side of all of this, which is so important to our culture. <clears throat> Did you want to come in there? This isn't so much about where people sit as how they feel part of LAS and part of their particular team. Oh, absolutely, and I, I think once um, once you you understand, and that was why I was asking about the percentages, because yeah. that sounds like a very high percentage to me that still want to continue to work from home. So I think that leads into whatever that looks like, how then do you make sure that we continue to engage those people effectively and probably more effectively than, than actually we, we may have done, um, you know, whilst we've been in lockdown. And, and you want to add to, thank you, Jane, and you want to add to that? Yeah, the only thing I, I would add is, is clearly that, that there's a large number of staff who don't have the option to work yes. from home and that, that can create a tension, I think. Um, the getting that balance right and particularly where you know, you're relying on teams, teams can't really form um, virtually, I think would be, be the evidence. So I'd agree with Jane getting that right in terms of what's the appropriate proportion of time people do actually spend together versus um, remotely is, is key. And maybe consider using, I know Damien isn't quite here and Kim, it worked across over point for mem members of the public, our new director of HR is due to start in June. Um, whether you use something like a Helen Bevan approach, who's got some more, you know, and Jane may have better ideas than Kim, a, a specific approach to this organisation of how we engage, other organisations will have done it, is it, you know, a team meeting that's a, I know Simon will be here, she has two meetings a week, one of which is pure business and the other is a social interaction business. What is the approach we're going to do and how does that marry up to the frontline people who, Zan points out, have to be here? I would urge you to think about a corporate response that will go a long way to help our staff feel they're part of our service because we know the back office people often feel rejected and neglected, or neglected, actually not rejected, neglected. They don't feel as important as paramedics on the front line. So something to think about. Okay, back to your report then, Kadir. Anything else you want us to note? I think Rommel had a question, Heather. Oh, beg your pardon, Rommel. Thank you, Chair. Um, just really to commend um, a the theme that comes through in both Garrett's and, and Kadir's report, which is, you know, the, the fact we've been able to make our case quite well over the, through the COVID year, in terms of getting the capital to invest and deal with some of the you know backlog of infrastructure issues so to commend that but also to be realistic about this and say that the money supply is not going to be there going yeah. forward so there's going to be a challenge here where we the lads are going to have to prioritize very very carefully all the must-dos that we need to finish you know the work we've already started but also other programs that we want to do which are must-dos so I'm just making the point that then we're going to prioritise very, very carefully. And then we need to think about the buff and the risk framework in relation to that, um, because it's always exciting to do new things, but we don't need to put ourselves at risk for things that have to happen, for example, cyber security progression mm -hmm. or rostering, all those things. I think that's the point very well made. In fact, all the points very well made. Thank you. OK, so we'll note your report and note a lot of progress in what I see, the unseen areas. But well done. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm now going to move on to the integrated performance report. And what I would like to ask is that we take each area. So, for example, if John does his Dutch quality top themes and then Mark <laughs> does his assurance and then we'll do questions generally and then move on to um, clinical care and Fenella give us the top themes and... Um, have I done that the wrong way around? Who does? Yeah. It'll be Mark again, really. We'll do his assurance and then questions. And then um, we, you know, move through it in that way so that we try to get it in a more compact but um, explainable way to the public and to ourselves. So let us kick off then quality and clinical care. And the detail is all in the pack for you. 
Thank you, Heather. So, um, three things to highlight from the integrated performance report and my report. Uh, so, the first is uh, incidents, which you'll find on page 11 and page 14. Uh, the incidents have come back to the mean, and so it's a good reporting culture for our organisation that our staff and our clinicians do put in uh, incidents when they note them, but it has uh, recovered from the, the second wave of the pandemic and the peak you'll see in those graphs for December and January. Uh, medical equipment and call handling are the two areas across the ambulance service and the integrated urgent care that, that come up highest currently. Uh, second point of note is that we've implemented the patient safety instant response framework. Uh, we're the only ambulance trust in the country to be piloting that, uh, and also the child protection information sharing system, which is critical uh, to ensuring that we keep uh, our children safe and uh, the safeguarding that comes with that. And the third area to highlight from the integrated patient uh, performance report is on page 25, which is uh, our excellence reporting. So alongside the incidents, we also have excellence reporting of our staff. Uh, they put in uh, these excellence reports, and we see in March that there were 144 excellence reports submitted. Uh, that's the highest month ever, so I think uh, it's positive to see that our staff are recognising in themselves the care that they are delivering. Uh, so there are three things that I, I would like to, to highlight. In terms of three areas of uh, future things to be looking at, the clinical education and standards department have opened their two new education centres this week, uh, so one in Newham Dockside and one in Brentford. Uh, so that is really positive, but uh, a review underway of how education functions within our organisation. Uh, second is the rollout of the station accreditation scheme, uh, links very closely to our CQC compliance. And thirdly, a refresh of the quality strategy, uh, which uh, would have been refreshed in 2020, but uh, due to COVID, that, that is now time to do that. So we're refreshing the quality strategy, and you'll find that within my report. Thank you. And I realise I explained how I wanted to do this really badly, so I apologise. <laughs> we'll do all three quality reports and then get Mark to comment, and then we'll move to the finance and audit mm -hmm. too, and then get Amit and Rommel. So apologies. So carry on now, uh, Fenella. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll take the report as read and just highlight a couple of areas. So from the integrated uh, performance report on page 12, um, the last data that came out of the National Ambulance uh, Quality Indicators has London Ambulance Service ranked first nationally uh, for the return of spontaneous circulation after a cardiac arrest. And we continue to provide an excellent service for our patients who are suffering a stroke, getting them to the emergency department well in time for them to undergo definitive assessment and then uh, care with a clock-busting drug if required. Um, from uh, the clinical education and development of our workforce, uh, the clinical education and standards, uh, clinical standards team has now moved over to uh, John under the chief paramedic role. But I would like to take the opportunity to recognise all the work that Tina Ivanov has done. Uh, she has now left the trust to take up a post as a director of quality at East Kent but has really led the transformation of clinical education, embracing the digital uh, technology that we have uh, been able to use during COVID and also the design of two new uh, multimedia centres, which we look forward to opening soon. And then the last one is just around the ongoing work that we are doing to make sure some of the excellent pathways that were put in during COVID uh, remain in place so that we can continue to provide a bespoke care for our patients uh, for example, mental health patients or patients who don't need to go to an emergency department but can be seen in a same-day emergency care uh, facility, reducing the pressure on emergency departments. OK, thank you. So, Mark, do you want to do the assurance piece and then we'll come back to questions in those areas? Certainly, well, you, you've got my report, so I'll be brief. Uh, just to highlight, um, we accepted last year's quality account and there have been good progress against the 18 priorities from last year, apart from one which was no longer applicable because uh, we weren't using that equipment <coughs> anymore with the change in transfer. Uh, looking at next year's quality reports, um, there's been a proposal for 10 quality priorities for next year, and we've asked for some more details about how they'll be monitored and taken further forward, and we look forward to seeing that going forward. Uh, medical devices is an issue that will be picked up between ourselves and the audit committee there's been yes. a, a range of challenges in that area, and we'll keep close review of that. Thank you. So are there any questions for um, John, Fenella or Mark on any of that? Uh, Jill? 
Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions. My first question is just around the, the vaccination programme for COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw in the report we have 44%. I just wondered if there was an update on that or um, whether or not we're seeing any challenges in the second dose. Fenella, do you want to answer that? So uh, the overall number of colleagues that have received uh, the vaccine uh, is above 80% for the first vaccine and uh, nearly 50% for the second vaccine. Uh, the rollout means that many of the second vaccines are only just due, um, but we are not at the moment have any, receiving any feedback of reluctance to uptake the second vaccine. And we all understand and we are um, communicating the importance given the variants of concern that are circulating at the moment. And do you want to comment on our one on one staff and our estate staff where we have a higher proportion of ethnic minority people and we know across London they're less likely to take the vaccine? Where are we with that? So we've been doing a lot of bespoke work uh, using um, our primary care uh, doctors that work in the organisation and our pharmacists to be able to go out and answer questions. And we've done webinars and we are seeing... Um, as it's rolled out more into the community and families are able to engage, we are seeing better uptake and we're continuing to provide one-to-one -one support to uh, help people to make the right decision um, for them. Um, it is not a mandated vaccine, but we are there to answer their questions. But it, you, the evidence appears to be that uh, by having the two vaccines, one's uh, immunity to this latest variant is greater and more likely to present as a, a cold flu type illness rather than presenting as hospitalisation and potential death. Yeah. Yes? So I, I think oh. that is right to highlight that I don't think we had worked out across the system the impact of not having your elderly relatives vaccinated before you. Paramedics mm -hmm. often felt it's a bit unfair me being vaccinated before my elderly patients in a culture which respects the elders rather more than we yeah. often see in British culture. And as they've now been vaccinated, staff are willing to come forward, and that's being recognised in the ethnic groups Good. more than elsewhere. Good. OK, and as the um, vaccine is available to the population, the younger population, are we optimistic there'll be a higher uptake generally, do you think, for Nello, London? So I, I think that uh, we have a higher a younger population in London, and so as it rolls out, there's a lot of work going on with... Uh, groups to be able to um, answer their questions as well, in particular around some of the perceived side effects to reassure and to provide the evidence to help them make yeah. an informed decision. And I suppose the other question we should be asking in the areas of London where this new variant is very <coughs> high, are we seeing increased activity for our services, either 111 or 999? So um, I think right across the system, we're seeing uh, an increasing uh, call volume coming in for 999 and 111, mm. but nothing to specifically link it. And the one area where there has been surge testing going on out in West London, yes. um, we haven't, uh, there's not uh, PCR surge testing going on at the moment, and we're monitoring that very carefully as part of the North West London 111 provision that we provide. And would we then monitor the sickness of our staff in that area? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions for John? No. <coughs> Karim? Yeah, I know it's a bit cross-cutting, but I just wanted to highlight the national rollout of the uh, iPads, which was based very much on uh, London Ambulance's innovation and experience in this, this area. And I think we've probably underplayed and undersold our you know, the work that was done to get that right, and also how important this will be going forward with the EPCR and things. So I think, you know, that's to be commended. I think that's very important. Thank you for reminding us of that. And also, I think, congratulations to Stuart Crichton, who's led the um, uptake of the IPAS, where our staff have been somewhat resistant, but also it opens us up to the cyber security issue that we raised earlier. John, did you want to comment Just on that? Just to provide some assurance, I did a shift at New Morden on Thursday, but my first time using uh, the iPad and EPCR, having been from my training, and it worked really well. Good, excellent. Thank you for that. OK, any more questions for... Yes, Anne, and then Amit, and then Jane. I just want to ask a question about stroke. Mm -hmm. on, on page 12, it, it, it says that we're seventh. Mm. In, in response rates. I, I wondered what was the 
the, the reason for that and what are the opportunities that we might have to, to improve? I think it's a very valid question. And Vanella? So um, we are seventh in, in the report that came out for the January data. Um, we are doing a piece of work to look at the care that's provided on scene to ensure that there are no delays in being able to move a patient. Um, we uh, have a slightly different challenge to some of the more rural ambulance services in that many patients who have strokes need to be conveyed either on a stretcher or in a wheelchair. And um, when, when there are not always lifts in buildings, that can just slow down a little bit but we are still getting our patients to hospital well in time for them to undergo a CT scan and then have the um, clot-busting drug. So the guidance that we have just reviewed and are putting out uh, through the clinical team managers out to our frontline clinicians is around those essential diagnostics that need to be done before you begin to move the patient to the ambulance to convey them to hospital. So are you saying the measure is wrong? It should be time to get to hospital, get the clot busted? No, I think, I think we just need to make sure that we're only doing on scene for a patient who's diagnosed with a stroke what absolutely needs to be done on scene right. and that we make um, progress towards hospital as soon as possible. So, and and it's raise... something we look at very carefully through the Quality Assurance Committee. I should say, Anne, you raised an issue that Mark has been very hot on for some time so it would be useful to see I guess with service improvement one is always looking for the timeline and trajectory to make sure that they only do the tests that they need to do on scene before transferring and it would be good to see that that evidence is sort of change management if we can do that yeah. thank you um Amit next thank you chair uh for now, great to see that we're continuing the paramedics and primary care work and um, the pilots that we've had running um I had a quick look on NHS jobs. We know that PCNs can advertise directly for these roles, and there aren't a load up there, but we've seen places like, I can see places like Sabine Hackney, Bromley, and Camberwell recruiting for PCN paramedics at Band 7. So I guess my question was, do we have mechanisms in place to track whether we are seeing some of our more experienced staff leave for these um, roles directly employed in primary care? Um. Yeah, Amit, I'm going to ask John to pick that up because he's now uh, overseeing the workforce. Uh, yep, so we have a, a stream, Amit, of uh, recording where paramedics leave. So for those going to PCM, we are, we are tracking them. As the paper points out, we are working in partnership as part of the pilots to try and encourage them to be on there. And the, the national scheme uh, for those who can't step straight into a band seven is that they are in rotational models with us in the ambulance service. So uh, yes, there is a PCN work stream. We are monitoring that. Um, and as part of our workforce reporting, we'll be, uh, be putting that forward in terms of the numbers that leave. If I could just add, there are significant concerns, not in the direction of travel, the policy decision, but in its implementation, and they're being picked up through ACE. So in some PCNs across the country, they're paying a much higher grade. There are issues about rotation. It's best for people to be on rotation. For some of the ambulance trusts, there are, there are no bank opportunities, so they can't be on rotation. There are skill issues. There are, whole, there are clinical supervision issues that GPs are not... Um, experienced in monitoring and assessing the competence of a paramedic, their experience is in uh, junior doctors, and that's a different cohort, and that's what the I think the very good PCNs are recognising. Kadir, you wanted to come in. Just to add, Chair, and to Amit, uh, so as a as an executive, we've we've considered the options in relation to paramedics in PCNs and our engagement within them. There's a number of trusts across the country that have taken an explicit decision not to engage and believe that it's not for them. Our view is that engagement is the right, is the right, is the right thing for us as an organisation. Uh, however, what we need to do, that, do is do that through the pilots that we are currently working with in Merton and in Redbridge and to see where the national position in relation to uh, some of the issues that Heather has flagged uh, land in order to, for us, then make a, an active decision as to whether we can proactively look to provide this for all PCNs in some way, shape so, or form, or not. I mean, this is very much for John to do with Kadir, but um, <coughs> we have to be clear what are the skills they are using 
And is it instead of urgent care? So should we see less referrals to our urgent care service? And should our advanced primary urgent care, I should be the people in primary care, there are a whole host of issues here that are being looked at nationally, but we need to be cognizant of them before we find we're duplicating. And the NHS can ill afford to duplicate what's already in a multidisciplinary team or what we're doing. It has to be an either or, really, or adding value. And it's not clear at the moment that it does that. But John will be on top of it. Which I think is why being part of the pilots is important rather yeah. than opting out. Yeah, no, indeed. OK. Um, Jane, you wanted to come in, I think, on this or something okay. else? Uh, yeah, I was back to iPads, actually, and I, I just wanted mm -hmm. to uh, uh, agree with, with Karen, you know, how great it's been in terms yes. of the rollout that we had with iPads. But as we're going to be getting replacements now, um, I wondered whether there was an opportunity to uh, wipe the, the old ones, as it were, clean, um, and whether we would be offering those to people that might be less fortunate than ourselves to, to use through a charity or whatever. That sounds excellent, but are we sure bank staff have got them first? Yes. Bank staff yes. did so, not have so them. something that Stuart is looking at about the opportunity for, um, for, for some of the, the schools, if it's possible. Uh, to do that um, as we receive the new ones. But it's important that all of our emergency responders, our community first responders and our bank uh, colleagues, plus other colleagues in logistics who go yes. around doing yeah. um, deliveries and medicines deliveries are all equipped with them first. So, um, so the answer it, is when we've ensured that everybody needs one, we've got one, then uh, Stuart is on to where could we give spare ones to, picking up on your point, a very well-made point, Jane. Thank you. Uh, Rommel, you wanted to come in? Thanks, Chair. I was just unmuting. Um, uh, Fenella, I, I guess, and probably John as well, it'd be interesting to see as you plot the Right Care programme, uh, a scorecard on clinical digital transformation and also medicine management KPIs. Uh, yes, um, we can certainly take, take that away. And as we um, move forward into the new logistics unit and the medicines packing unit, um, that is uh, something that uh, Emily Grist, as the performance improvement manager for logistics, and Sumitra as our chief, chief pharmacist, are already um, looking at being able to report that. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Any I'm more? Sorry. sorry. Sheila. I Sorry, Chair, just building on that point from Rama, can I just test then? So, um, Fanella, would that be linked to the refresh of the digital strategy, which I know um, we received a report at the LIC that the digital strategy is being refreshed. So how is the digital strategy and the clinic, how are those clinical digital and digital strategy converging? So through our clinical chief information officer, we're making sure that those are linked up and we don't we don't miss something, um, and also don't duplicate, and that they are um, targets that are are meaningful to be able to report. So okay. yeah, I think it straddles across across the two. Um, quite a lot of the digital strategy, which is clinically based, will be covered through Right Care Right Place. Yeah, I, I think it, it, it it's very helpful. I think to take a, a patient back approach. Yeah. Uh, so rather than a sort of infrastructure or technology forward approach. So uh, I, I think if we can drive it through that lens that you're driving it through and, and just integrate the two, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. I'll take that forward. Thank you very much. I'm going to move us on now to assurance around people and culture and take the same approach. So Kim, Jane, afterwards um, to give us assurance. So um, Kim, then Jane. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my uh, report covers a, a breadth of activity over um, the last couple of months um, as an ongoing piece from previous reports. Key areas, I think, to pick out. Um, well, the first one is the progress on the Black Lives Matter action plan. Of course, today is the first year anniversary of the sad death of George Floyd and um, and there's been quite a lot of activity over many months to ensure that within LAS um, the key areas of work stream are continuing. Um, and these 
are reported to the People and Culture Committee so that we can really um, ensure that momentum is maintained. Um, further work that's developing in that area is around stamping out racism. So it's a piece that LAS are leading on on behalf of AIDS um, and creating opportunities for learning and, and general awareness on where we can do better. Um, we're reviewing all the recruitment and selection training programmes and ensuring that we have diverse panels, not only on the more senior posts, but on every post that we, uh, we advertise. Um, and uh, there's been um, a substantial amount of work uh, preparing the Be Mentored programme, which is going to be rolling out in the next few weeks. Um, and all of this has seen an increase in our overall number of BME staff joining the organisation. They still seem to be concentrated in the lower grading levels in bands one to four, um, as indicated in the red indicators, but um, more work is now being undertaken to ensure that we have a full development programme and offers uh, to uh, consider career aspirations and then to see how we can really accelerate um, progress in, in all of those areas. Um, the, the, the chair's already mentioned the work as well around the, uh, the um, uh, women's um, forums that have been held uh, for, uh, in relation to the uh, sad um, death of uh, Sarah Everard. And so all of these areas do start to highlight that this is something that our colleagues um, need to ensure that we have at front and centre in our focus and that we're doing all we can to ensure their safety um, but also their, their personal development and dealing with some um, uh, behaviours that maybe as a, a modern organisation of a professional standing that, that we would want to, uh, to um, focus on and address. Um, in terms of the staff survey, uh, there's been quite a lot of work that's been undertaken there too, building on the results from this year, which did see some improvements. Um, and uh, each directorate is working on their individual actions as they present in their area. Um, there are some similarities uh, across the board, which um, AppsCon is picking up on and will be taking uh, a t a t uh, having those discussions um, uh, with directors. Um, but there are some real drivers for, for change coming up in, in the staff survey and some really good engagement with staff uh, who are able to voice their opinions and, and where they see some um, some interventions would be would be helpful. Um, in terms of um, sickness, it's another area where the overall the organisation has remained fairly stable. Um, we are seeing some post-COVID syndrome, uh, previously called long COVID. Um, so have set up a wellbeing group. Um, this is a virtual group. It's held every two weeks. And it currently has 25 members that have signed up to that group. And some really positive feedback coming out. Um, and I'm getting uh, comments in my inbox uh, thanking the wellbeing team uh, for the work that they're doing with that particular group. So we will keep that under review to make sure that we're doing all we can to support those, um, those staff particularly. Um, the resolution framework has also been launched. This is a great piece of work. Uh, has uh, been over um, a while now to get that resolution framework in place. Uh, we now have 16 internal mediators that are trained and another 95 resolution mediators, uh, advocates, um, sorry, that, that work right across uh, all areas of the organisation. So we are getting some anecdotal uh, feedback on resolutions being dealt with before they even enter a formal stage now uh, and, and those discussions happening at the first point of contact. So we, we will be developing a series of KPIs to go along with the new resolution framework so that they can that information can be reported up to the board. And what you have in your pack um, is a breakdown of grievances, disciplinaries, some more formal stuff that we have ongoing uh, currently, which, which has seen a reduction, and uh, we continue to monitor that progress. 
um, I think they were the, um, the, the key areas I wanted to highlight from my report, but of course happy to take any questions. Thank you. Let's move to Jane first, and then we'll come back to questions. Jane. <coughs> Thank you, Heather. Um, yeah, I'll just pick up on a couple of bits from my report that are different to those that Kim has mentioned. Um, we went through the 18-month plan for the People and Culture Department in some detail um, at the meeting. Um, and whilst we recognised the positive activity, we remained cautious um, and recognised that not all actions yet were delivering um, and wanted to, to suggest to, to Kim and the team that they were, uh, they were perhaps a little over ambitious about making things green um, when actually they pro were probably still um, amber. So there, there's an opportunity, I think, here to, to, to really get assurance uh, that these initiatives in the 18 month plan are delivering um, and are delivering well. So things have started and they've, they've started well, um, but I think uh, we need to keep a close eye on that. Um, we also received the uh, Freedom to Speak Up annual report um, where we noted that concerns have, had actually dropped uh, in 2021 um, uh, to 155. And we weren't sure at this moment in time whether that was to do with the pandemic or whether that was actually to do with improved processes and relationships with managers. It may be actually that it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, but certainly uh, that will be tracked uh, going forward and we'll start to understand uh, what that really does mean for us um, as, as, as more normality um, actually resumes. Um, I thought I'd just mention we had an excellent presentation from Andrew Goodman, uh, Director of Strategic Assets and Property, uh, where he was talking about um, what he had been doing with, with the team there. Um, and it really is a blueprint for how to make change happen. Um, and uh, we, we talked about the fact that we should be learning uh, from what Andrew has done, because actually what he has uh, he's brought to that department is true leadership. Um, and therefore, there's an opportunity here to say, how's that happened? What are the sorts of things that he's been getting engaged with? And how can people and culture start to support other parts of the organisation um, in, in doing the same, um, but, but some tremendous work uh, that, that has been done. So I think in total, we took much assurance um, from the meeting in terms that, that the key priorities are moving forward. Uh, now it's making sure that those are sustained um, and we can continue to, uh, to deliver uh, on the 18 month plan. Jane, thank you, Kim. Thank you. Questions for Kim or Jane? Uh, Lorraine. It's, it's not a question, but really just to sort of reinforce um, the, the good work that um, Andrew Goodman is doing, um, because it gave me the opportunity to, uh, to actually go and visit some of the, um, the staff who've been uh, involved in these um, sort of re-engagement sort of exercises, and really insightful for how we're going to approach this business planning when that sort of uh, starts back again. Good, that's good to hear. And as um, Kudir knows, my challenge is if we go and speak to... Uh, the equivalent of the man sweeping the floor in the Cape Canaveral JFK example, will they know what we're doing and why and what are the top three things they're doing in their business plan in their area? Just, just to add, I, so I agree with everything that's been said and I think it's a fair challenge, Heather, because um, what Andrew's brought is a bit of leadership and kind of a drive to, to try and corral everybody and move things forward. But yes, we need to move away from being peop in individual people mm. dependent and to have that governance, systems, processes and culture that kind of have that continuous improvement. But I think what Jane has highlighted, rather like uh, for organisations and special measures on the clinical quality side, where there's um, a methodology for service improvement, mm. those trusts sustain it. Mm. And I think what you are suggesting, Jane, without wanting to put words in your mouth, so please tell me if I've got this wrong, that in terms of um, management, there is a service change methodology that we ought to adopt as an organisation that HR could lead. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, I, I think certainly it was, um, for me, it was a blueprint. And I think that yep. there, it is definitely worth looking at how blueprint. Andrew has approached that mm -hmm. and through his leadership. And that is something that could be adopted, yes. Okay, so perhaps we could ask the executive and the people in culture committee through Anne taking over from you to look at that and come back and... If we can do, and it's back to communication for staff so that they know 
Okay, thank you. Other questions for... Uh, sorry, Chair, could I just build on, on Jane's point? Yes. Um, if I may, um, so because at the LIC uh, last week, we also reviewed, Andrew gave us an update on the work he's now doing, which I think is an add to the blueprint, mm -hmm. Jay, on the staff survey results. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's very impressive, the level of detail he's gone into, how his team have diagnosed the key areas of focus and now how they're tackling those. So we have recommended that Andrew you know, has regular touch points with the PCC, um, because I think there's some mutuality. He needs some assistance as well in terms of driving his change program. And obviously there's clearly some benefit in terms of, you know, his touch points with, with the PCC going forward. And, um, you know, it's been very impressive the work he's done in a short space of time. So I just want to underline that uh, it okay. comes out very strongly at the Logistics and Infrastructure Committee as well. I think there was a suggestion that he should present to the board to build on that. So that might be useful for us all to hear that. So we can see if we can do that at some point, whether at the development session or main board. But that's really helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Jill? Yeah, just, uh, just a comment, really, just to build on what um, Jane was saying. I just see uh, the diversity and inclusion of work. So I can see that the plan is 75% complete, um, but there's a number of key actions that are remaining. I such as the recruitment selection panel. I just think it would be quite helpful to understand what the timelines are for yes. completing those, because that would seem to be, that particular one, quite fundamental to making sure we've got A the good right point, representation. Jill. Can the exec come back with that, please? You probably haven't got it today. Yeah. OK, thank you. I just wanted to comment on the staff survey, if I may, the results. Whilst we seem to have made good progress, on workforce indicators for people with disability. I have to say, given all the work we have done on Black Lives Matter, it is disappointing, uh, the results for BME, and I think we have to have a very strong focus on that because we are not delivering. And I had an email to me suggesting that we'd made no progress at all. And whilst I recognise the person might have a particular perspective, I think we've got a long way to go. And I think when you listen to the media coverage of a year on from George Floyd, that is the message to the country as a whole. So I would like to see um, us taking that forward in an even more proactive way, please. Yeah, can I make a comment? Yes, please do. Um, so a, a comment, which was that, that there was a theme in the report around staff engagement, and I think it would be worth certainly through PCC exploring more some of the evidence base about what are the components that, that, that drive drive that more broadly than, yes. than the communication. So I'll, I'll take that as a, an action to, to, to pick Thank up. You. My question was around the workforce plan in numbers, mm -hmm. which I think, again, Andrew Goodman has been working on, am I right? And is now with John, I think. No, so... I was the lead and for the workforce, yeah. workforce strategic workforce plan and yeah. I've now handed over uh, uh, that work to John. Yeah, and so my question is, is, is there a plan to regularly report against that in, in at the board in terms of, I can see it's not in <laughs> yeah. today, but um, I assume there would be a, a plan to do that and just one flag to me when I looked at the data was this really significant drop in turnover which I guess you would expect um, given the year that uh, we've, we've all had. had in terms of people not necessarily looking to you know over five percent drop in turnover so um, that would suggest to me a significant risk of the converse yes. happening as, as things break up yeah. so also some assurance that in those workforce planning trajectories um, that we've taken to account um, that bounce back. I think that's very valid. And Rommel? I guess a question just building on what Anne has raised. The recruitment risk remains high at 16. And I just wondered where we were on the uh, international Paris 269 that we're trying to uh, recruit in. 
Anybody got the answer to that, or can we take it off? Well, I think just to answer to, to Anne's question, uh, and I'm sure Jane, Jane might want to uh, uh, come in, that this is uh, something that is regularly reported and discussed uh, and, and monitored within the PNCC committee, and obviously the reports come up through the Integrated Performance Report to the board. Uh, I think it's something that we're very acutely aware of the, uh, uh, the medium to long-term risks around staff retention. Uh, and I know other parts of the health service are already experiencing some of those challenging challenges in other allied health professions. So we are we're very alive to it, and uh, and I think there's virtually not a meeting of the PCC, uh, or indeed the uh, the the regular operational performance meetings at an executive level where we're not focused on this very closely. I think the difference between us and other organisations is we have a very high uh, dependence on our powers. And I think the bit about retention being good at the moment, but we might get a big shock. Uh, we really do need to focus on yeah. our best estimate of what that could be and how we're going to cover it, yeah. which links to the iPara recruitment. And I was hearing just in another trust how an Australian director of uh, acting director of nursing actually can't get back into their own country easily at the moment. They've been here 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, whereas their partner who's on a visa from another country can. So I think it's not straightforward. Yeah. They need yeah. real, we do need assurance at the board as well as at the People and Culture yeah. Committee. And, and part of this is about ramping up the, the, the homegrown paramedic pathways, yes. uh, and that is a big focus uh, for John as but well, it's a lag. Work, working alongside mm -hmm. Kim uh, to, to look at expanding that. I've, I've, I've been quite challenging, I think it's probably fair to say, my colleagues around the, the relative size of our uh, paramedic pathway uh, at LLES, both in terms of the student. Uh, the university student pathway and the apprenticeship pathway uh, that is simply not as big as it could be and probably should be for a, an organisation our size. So uh, and that's that's what we've got to develop and we've got to wean ourselves off. Uh, you know, the extent to which we rely on international paramedics, I don't think I would be saying we, we don't want international paramedics. I think we do. I think they have been a hugely valuable part of the cultural development of the organisation uh, and, you know, recognising, you know, the global nature of our city. It's great that we're able to reflect the diversity of our community uh, in, uh, in the workforce, but we have had an over-reliance on that, there is no doubt, and, uh, and we are working hard to, re to, to get that back in proportion. So we need to see that through PCC and then board assurance because it is a significant risk to us. We need to then review that back through the BAS, particularly yep. around the iParents, I think. I need to move us on because I, um, I thought this would be a more efficient way of doing the agenda. It's not turning out to be that way, so we'll review at the end. But I just want to raise sickness levels, not for now, but that 5% hides a much higher percentage in EOC and frontline staff. I think the front line, the EOC is going up. It was 14% the last time I saw it. And um, paramedics, frontline people is about 11%. So I think we need to be saying, what is that? Because it does not appear to be COVID. Um, but we can pick that up offline and next time we report being clear that it um, underlies another problem. Thank you. So moving on then to assurance around finance and audit. Uh, Lorraine, please. Yes. So thank you, Chair. So my, my report um, covers the, uh, the activities to provide the best possible value for the taxpaying public and uh, referenced on pages uh, 28 to 32 of the Integrated Performance Report. Um, there were sort of three things that I wanted to draw out. The first is uh, obviously the results for the, um, the March uh, reporting period. But as we do have that as a detailed item, I was going to propose to take that with the annual accounts yes, and fine. just give that thank as context. You. But just to suffice to say for now that we, um, I'm very pleased to uh, report that we met all of our statutory financial duties uh, and in fact with a slightly improved position on our, on our uh, forecast outturn. Um, so the other two items that I just wanted to draw out um, before I take questions um, are on the, the business planning um, sort of position for 21-22. Uh, uh, as we have reported before, um, we are still in a a fixed um, a sort of block uh, position. Uh, we have now had confirmation of our uh, financial framework for the first half, and just to confirm um, that we have uh, agreed a, 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 a balanced plan um, for the first half. Uh, that is um, in line with our host, Northwest London um, uh, ICS plan. 
and that um, will be submitted uh, on the 26th of May in line with the national guidance. Um, also, we are re recommencing our business and financial planning for the second half. Um, this is an, in um, advance of confirmation of the uh, income envelope, and we would expect that to be in place um, in the next uh, month uh, to two months. Uh, but the uh, plan is that we will bring back to the board the approval of our um, second half plan um, in, at the next board. So that will be the July board. Um, and then I just wanted to draw attention to um, an important area that we've been um, focusing on and made, I think, um, good progress. Uh, this is in relation to our procurement and sort of the buying culture of the organisation. And just to, um, to note that we are on track with um, the coverage, the contract sort of compliance. Uh, we have hit, um, in fact, overachieved our, our um, 2021 target of 60%. Um, so our non-pay spend uh, cover is now 64% uh, and on track to meet the sort of the Carter uh, sort of uh, um, targets of 80% um, for, for this next year. So I just sort of commend, commend those. Those are an important uh, element of uh, financial uh, control, compliance and delivery. All right. Thank you. So Amit from the Finance and Investment Committee and then Rommel from Audit, please, Assurance. Thank you, Chair. Just to highlight a couple of additional points from the insurance report. Um, we, fit, we received the first draft five-year capital plan, um, which was great to see. It's the first time um, as an organisation we've developed a five-year capital plan to give us more forward visibility, which was very helpful. Um, for this financial year, the trust has been allocated an uh, initial capital limit of just over 21 million. Um, and the committee recognised that that was um, really only enough to complete the existing in-flight capital projects that we started last year, um, and that more capital would be required to address other high priority issues. And that's something that I know uh, Lorraine and Kadir will be um, taking up with other ICSs, um, but that, that was important to flag. And given that uh, gap between our desired capital for this financial year and the current available capital, we asked the executive to go away and consider whether this was a, um, whether there was a back level risk around capital um, to come back and uh, report to uh, the board in a future up, uh, update. Uh, and the only other thing to highlight is um, 111 IUC, uh, as Kadir mentioned in matters rising, we have an excellent report on progress that we've been making and next steps for 111 IUC. As part of that, the committee was asked to approve um, three uh, contract extensions with other providers, uh, Derbyshire Healthcare United, Heart Surgery Care and Integrated Care Group. Um, these allow us additional uh, capacity in a way that's cost effective and volume related. So we got assurance that this was the right thing to do uh, to uh, approve those contract extensions whilst the lean review of 111 IUC takes place and um, you know there was a commitment to going out to formal procurement should that be required rather than doing another contract extension in future. Thank you, Amit. And Rommel from an audit perspective. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just to mention, I guess, the timelines that we're operating to. Um, the, the audit committee is still reviewing the internal and external audit assurances. So there's a further audit committee meeting on the 27th of May and another one on the 10th of June. Uh, that's before the, we have to submit numbers to the NHSI, which is on the 15th of June. So um, we're still in train with all of that. And, and just report, it's, it's good progress. Um, my meeting with the external auditors on Friday uh, didn't highlight any significant issues, and I hope that remains the case. And internal audit have also signaled uh, significant assurance with some improvement required. So uh, to, to commend the team, I think, and, and fingers crossed that nothing changes uh, between now and the 27th and all the 10th. Um, and I guess the later item we'll take just to note that, which Trish will cover, that the, uh, the audit committee's comments have been taken account of in the annual governance statement uh, that the board is being asked to approve uh, later. And the only other item to note is the uh, audit committee will, uh, sorry, did review and approve the count fraud return, which uh, Lorraine and I will complete sometime this week. 
Um, the intention is to put all of this in terms of the assurances into a written paper, including the work the audit committee has done during the year, into a written report, which we'll email round to the board uh, just prior to the final meeting of the audit committee, uh, assuming you are okay to delegate approval to the audit committee for the accounts given the timeline that I mentioned we are operating to, uh, and to send you that report by before the 10th of June. Thank you. So we'll take that decision when we get to the report, but thank you for that. Are there any questions people need to raise at this point? We note the good progress on the procurement. We note the outturn position, which we'll get later. Um, and we note the assurance from the FIC, but some further questions. Um, and we'll come to the annual report. So are we happy to move on? Yep. Thank you. So if it's so well prepared and set out, we don't need to go into any more detail at this stage. OK, thank you. Uh, logistics and infrastructure. So um, I haven't actually got a separate report from Kadir, so let's go straight to Sheila. We've had Kadir's report earlier. Sheila, from your... Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'll cover logistics and infrastructure, and then if I may, I'll just uh, give a verbal update on D999. Please do, please do, thank uh, you. Because we, we just met yesterday, so there, yeah. there isn't a formal report in your mm -hmm. papers. Uh, so three things to call out um, from the logistics and infrastructure meeting last week. Uh, and Amit's already covered uh, one of them, which is the capital plan challenges. So we approved, um, sorry, we reviewed, we didn't approve, we reviewed and recommend um, the infrastructure modernization business case, which was presented to the LIC. Now that case um, is uh, requiring an 8.4 million investment over the next five years, of which 3.2 approximately is required in this current financial year. It's a very important case um, because it, first of all, um, it will look to mitigate some of our current BAF risks on infrastructure and cyber. Um, and part of that is to complete the work on moving our data center to the Crown hosting service. Uh, but the other important element of it is it will modernize our network and it will allow us to have much greater efficiency in terms of routing our 111 and 999 calls across our different sites. So we do recognize it's a very important case, but we also appreciate the challenge we have on the capital available to us. Uh, so we discussed um, the prioritization work that's ongoing. Um, and um, also we discussed the uh, work that Lorraine and, and Kadir are doing to hopefully source additional funds, uh, because it's very clear to us that if you put this case alongside all the other work we need to do, we just don't have sufficient funds available. Um, and um, we did talk about, um, you know, as we're doing prioritization work, it'll be important that we give quite a high rating to some of these critical infrastructure programs, um, because these are, in my view, certainly must do, and I think in the committee's view, must do items. Uh, so just to um, recommend for the exec to go back and have another look at this case and look at the prioritization exercise and perhaps come back in due course. Uh, with a recommendation on uh, whether we can take this case forward. So I think she uh, that's, that was one it. item. Um, <laughs> the second item I call out is we, we had um, a very good update on um, a number of the transformation programs. And we looked at, uh, we got an update on the Hub One, the Next Gen Ambulance, um, uh, Next Gen Ambulance uh, program, and also the move of our um, Emergency Operations Centre from Bow to Newham. And the first thing I'd like to say is that we as a committee really want to commend Kadir and the team for, you know, introducing an added amount of rigor and governance around these programs. So it was very good to see the level of rigor and the transparency, albeit there are issues and risks, but we felt uh, very good to see, to see that level of transparency. So I just want to commend the team on the work they're doing to bring all those programs together. Um, now, it did highlight for us um, a, a very important um, risk. All three programs highlighted a risk around people and culture change. Uh, and those um, that risk was read on all three programs. So there's a common theme uh, emerging here. So we discussed that. I mean, there are various elements around people and culture change across each of those programs. But what we talked about was the really the need for a more integrated, and we, we covered this in the in the matters arising earlier, but this more integrated mapping out of all of our programs 
and all of the implications for our people and for culture change and being able to see that as one big program of work so that we can then look at the risks and mitigations the types of resources and change management expertise we're going to need to drive these programs forward effectively um, and aligned to that we also discussed whether or not this should be uh, considered as a BAF risk uh, so we asked the exec um, to take that away and uh, just consider it, uh, think about the wording, what the mitigations might be, and bring that back to the board um, for future consideration. Okay. And then my final point is just a, a minor detail around the terms of reference for the LIC. Um, we asked the board to uh, pr approve a slight change in the terms of reference. This would be to um, require for two NEDs to be in attendance rather than three NEDs for us to be core eight and to remove the dependency on having NEDs in the majority. And this will just allow us to have more effective uh, scheduling of, um, of the, the committees going forward. Thank you, Sheila. Let's just go back. I think it's important that we don't duplicate our efforts. So I would have thought that the bit about um, the change management and where all the projects come together should be part of the work that you are doing with Rommel with Garrett as a starting point that then links into Anne and the change management rather than an, another piece of work. Um, also, when the executive are looking at priorities, they need to look at the strategic aims. And of course, interoperability allows us to be the integrator of uh, 111999. So I think in terms of prioritising, we'd urge you to look at our three strategic aims, see how it fits against that. And then the last one, um, I will open it up to other questions. but. I had a question, which is in, um, Tricia, do you know the answer to this? I thought that in assurance committees, the non-execs had to be in the majority. Um, not necessarily, and they're equal. So we have done this for other committees. So okay. we, um, we believe that it's okay, it meets the regulations. It does meet the regulations. So if it meets the regulations, are people content? I can see it makes it easier to get flexibility for the committee meetings. Um, are happy, people happy to approve that change? Yes, getting nods, not getting any verbals, but I'm getting yes. nods, maybe yes. that's better. Positive mm -hmm. nods, okay, thank you, we've approved that then. Um, any other questions for Sheila on those elements before we move on to D99? No? Pardon? Oh, Rommel, sorry, difficult to see. Yes, I can see that hand. Thank <laughs> Rommel. you, thank you, Chair. Just, just a point to raise, I guess, as you think about the committee structures going forward, which I know you're, you're, you're thinking, thinking about, is, is how the board continues to keep oversight on transformation yeah. programs and then just the amount of change we've got going on. Well, there so, is a question of whether that is our uh, number one BAF risk. When you look at the staff survey, when you look at the risk about um, the staffing and changes to that, and then the transformation we're trying to do with the hubs and how we want people to work, uh, I think we should ask the exec to look at it in that context. Yeah, would you be up for that, looking at that? I think so. I think, it, I mean, they're, they're very valid um, points. I think my, my gut reaction is we need to understand the scale and timing of some of these risks as we're talking over quite a long period of time. Uh, and, you know, if you take Hub 1, Hub 1 is a very transformational piece of work that we need to get right and will form a template for the transformation of the organisation going forward. But it is only a transformation in one part of London, uh, one of you know, 18 group stations. So it's not a, it's not a here and now uh, London-wide sort Which of or organisational wide BAF risk, but there is a risk to the strategic delivery of the longer term programme if we don't get the, the I exemplar would sort of right. I go back to your I mean. six themes. Unless we make yeah. progress on the six yeah. themes, we won't have a viable organisation. So look, if I could urge you to look at it in that context. Well, yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Sheila, do you want to talk to us about the D999? And noted, yeah. Rommel, I would say. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so just on the D999, so um, meeting occurred yesterday. So um, firstly, just to say that we reviewed um, the closeout of the electronic patient care records um, project, which has now moved into business as usual. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we want to call out and recognise the great achievement uh, of this programme. Uh, it's been an exemplar uh, for the Trust and um, big congratulations go to Stuart Crichton, Peter Rhodes, um, Giles Gaskell and of course um, 
Charles Clayton, sorry, and of course um, to Kadir himself for, for driving this forward um, and all the team involved. Um, we're now over the 90% take up rate, which is fabulous. Um, and um, we obviously will continue to um, look at opportunities uh, to optimize the data set that we now have available to us. We discussed that a little bit, you know, how can we now uh, leverage the data that we have available, linking that with other trusts and the wider system. And I know that's something that Kadir and the team are taking forward for consideration as part of the refresh of the digital strategy and linking it obviously into the work that you're doing for now on the clinical strategy. Uh, so that's really good progress. Um, we did also review um, the, um, you know, the results of the project in terms of did it, did it deliver on time and to budget? And I'm pleased to say that it did, it delivered on time and to budget in line with the full business case. Um, we then looked at the comprehensive uh, report that we received from Lorraine on the uh, benefits capture and benefits realization program, which has been driven by Jamie Drake. And it's a really excellent piece of work. Um, that did highlight and showed, uh, demonstrated to us the cash releasing and the non-cash releasing benefits and how we're tracking to deliver on those as aligned with the business case. It did highlight that there is a gap at the moment. So the cash releasing benefits are currently tracking at 2.8 million versus the 3.8 million outlined in the business case. So we discussed what the opportunities are to pull back some of that 1 million gap. And we believe there are some opportunities uh, to improve that position over the coming months. We don't know if we'll get to the full 1 million recovery, but certainly to an element of it. Um, so on, in terms of the CAD, um, the Computer Aided Dispatch Program, uh, this is making good progress. Um, and we reviewed in particular the risks and dependencies associated with the program. And I just want to mention a couple of those because I think they're important for the board to be aware of. Uh, one key risk is on the move of the, um, the Emergency Operations Centre from Bow to Newham. That must happen before CAD goes live, or certainly that's the current plan. Now, at the moment, that's planned to go live, or the move is planned to take place by September, but there isn't a lot of contingency in that plan. Um, and of course, what we discussed was leaving sufficient time to allow our EOC staff to settle into their new environment, get used to their new surroundings, before we then introduce a CAD, which is due to go live in November. So you can see that the timelines are quite tight there. So uh, there is going to be a, an ongoing watching brief uh, to develop a number of scenarios to look at those options and make sure that we have sufficient timeline, time lag between those two programs going live. Now, of course, if the um, if we if we have any delays, then it's very likely that in that case we would have to make a decision to move the uh, the go live for the CAD beyond the winter period into something like March of next year. We're not at that point at the moment. We're going to take a number of checkpoints in July and September to make that determination. But I do want to flag that it, it could it could become a reality for us. And uh, the other big risk we discussed, of course, was a COVID third wave. And if that occurs, then of course there would be a significant impact on the um, on the CAD go live date. Um, and then one final point I'd raise on, on CAD risks and mitigations is we, we spent also quite a bit of time discussing the performance um, that we would need to see and the testing of the performance of the new CAD under peak load conditions. So that would be like under a New, Year, new Year's Eve scenario. So we discussed you know, how that can be brought about, how, could, how we can we simulate a New Year's Eve condition so we can be assured that the CAD, when it does go live, will perform as expected. So the, the team is doing a lot of really good work looking at various scenarios to, to support that. Um, and then finally, just to call out, and again, I would, I would call this a bit like Jane uh, mentioned earlier, I would call this a blueprint um, and something that we should take forward for other programs. We reviewed the change management plan which is a very comprehensive piece of work that the team has brought together. And in that, they've also identified 20 plus change impact assessments on different groups across the trust. And they're the, the, you know what the impact is, whether it's high, high impact, medium impact, low impact, and what they are doing in terms of training and awareness uh, to support um, the changes that will take place as a consequence of the new CAD. Uh, so I think that's a really good piece of work and would recommend uh, that, you know, for other programs, we could use a similar blueprint. Um, and then just to finally say that there has been really good progress in terms of some of the sneak peeks and demos.
that have taken place with over 400 of our EOC and call handlers have had a look at the system and the, the feedback so far has been positive. And there's also really good progress being made on the development of the formal training material, which is about 75% ready at this point in time, more work to be done, but really good progress. Um, we also talked about the clinical and quality impact assessments, and we looked at the governance structure that's in place to make sure that we're taking care of any clinical and quality uh, matters and impacts associated with the program. And Mark, who's, uh, who's chair, obviously, of the Assurance Committee, sits on the, the LIC and, or sits on the D999 and was going to take that forward for review. And then as a final piece of assurance, um, PwC um, gave us a report on recent reviews they conducted on the testing plan and on the change management plan. And I'm pleased to say that their report was very complimentary as well of the work uh, so far. So we have added assurance from PwC uh, with respect to the programme to date. Sheila, thank you. I think what I'm hearing is that Trust is beginning to adopt good change management policies, but we need to make sure they are consistent and it seems to me the work from Andrew Goodman could be linked in to that work because it's all about how staff perceive it and settle in. Uh, so maybe a presentation on that's really, really valuable. And the Price Waterhouse Assurance is also very good. So thank you, all of you, for that. Um, and I think it seems there's some letters that maybe Garrett and I should write from the board to key members of staff. And if you give us those names, we could do that. So I think it is worth calling out. Fantastic. Yeah, okay, absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Right, are there any questions or can we move on? Can I, I just briefly, I just brief, well, yeah, briefly point out the, you know, the, the challenges with delivering the new CAD, I think Sheila's articulated very well and we need mm. to be cautious and, uh, uh, and uh, make sure we manage the delivery of that. I just point out that delay is not without consequence. Um, uh, we, you know, we originally scheduled to be delivering the new CAD around now in the spring of this year and uh, through various reasons covid related and uh, and others you know we have pushed that back as sheila's articulated very very clearly you know uh, a delivery uh, just before the advent of a, of a winter even aside from a potential third wave is not ideal and there is the potential for it to fall back further it, that, that i think has you know that has knock on consequences in terms of our ability to deliver other parts of our agenda particularly around 999111 integration because it delays our ability to move to pathways uh, and that in turn also has impacts on uh, our ability to deliver on our efficiency right. agenda going forward but so the, these things are all interlinked i'm not suggesting yeah. there's a right yeah. or wrong answer to it i'm just but the response to that has to be obviously a third wave of covid is outside your control but how well we manage this change in the way that sheila set out and we've heard from andrew before will enable us, if, if the staff have been well prepared, they will settle quickly, which will enable us to get on with it. So the challenge back is how well do we do that process, which then wouldn't lead to a delay. But a third spike of COVID we have to take seriously, or is it a fourth spike? Heaven knows. Okay, so we note that. Thank you. Um, right, and Anthony, um, LS Patient and Public Council, please report to us. The uh, the notes from the meeting in yes. February. We were a member of the council last um, last May. Um, it's uh, 20 public and patient reps, and it's for us to hear the voice of patients, uh, the public, and local communities. And the board receives the notes of all of the meetings, and these are the notes of the February meeting. Um, and at that meeting, up you'll see the discussion that took place, which was really good. And I know a number of Ned colleagues um, came to observe. Um, the other news from that meeting is we appointed Michael Bryan as co-chair um, alongside uh, Dame Christine Beasley. Thank you. Any questions on that? I, certainly good progress from where we were and see good engagement. Um, and you've had another meeting subsequently, haven't you? Yes, and the agenda is attached opposite. Yeah, yeah no. The, the, okay. The next meeting. Thank you. So we note progress, which is very good to see, and good engagement. Thank you. by both members of the public, but also our staff in that. So positive relationships, which is helpful. Thank you. That moves us on then to the, um, just checking I've got that right, the annual report from Garrett and Anthony, and it is in draft at the moment. Who is taking that first? Uh, I think, Chair, if you're happy, we'll take them together. Um, they are both presented uh, 
obviously for... Uh, the annual report the, and the annual governance statement, yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah sure. They're, they're, okay. they're presented for, for the, the views and approvals of, of, of the board, but there is a specific request to approve the delegation of the final sign-off to the audit committee. Okay. Uh, and Trisha may like to comment on that and also the the next item uh, around the self-certification. Okay. So let's just, um, in terms of the content, when do you need feedback from non-execs on that? Anthony, is that you? When, when's the dead? Or oh, Trisha, you're waving at me. Yeah. Yes, we have had our comments back from my execs and board members, so thank you for that. And um, they are in convene so that everybody can see the comments we've had. If you have any further comments, please get them back to us uh, by the end of the week. We have had quite comprehensive feedback, and they will be going into the final report. Okay, thank you. So um, we then need to ask, can we approve the annual governance statement? Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. So the I will take... The three reports, which yes. is 9.1, 9.2, and 10, because they are all interrelated okay, that's to fine. Thank the you. governance statement. Yeah. Uh, so we have had the comments. As I've said, we will finalise these reports. There are two issues for the board to note in terms of the annual governance statement, which is around uh, control issues in relation to the wholesale dealer's licence for Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Authority that was identified during the year. And the second issue was in relation to the procurement, contract management and reporting of immunisations, which we touched on earlier, all of which have had immediate risks and ongoing risks monitored and managed through their relevant committees. Uh, so that's for the board to note. We have another issue currently under investigation, and as it's under investigation, it's inappropriate to give detail. But if we uh, identify that there is control issues from that incident, we will report them in the 21-22 annual governance statement. So I'm asking the board to note the report and give delegated authority to the audit committee who will receive the final uh, versions of the report, discuss those with the internal auditors on the 27th of May, as uh, Rommel identified earlier, for submission and final sign-off on the 10th of June before submitted on the 15th of June. Um, so if the board could approve that, we will take those actions forward. So these are important uh, reports. Um, we've had a briefing on the new issue. We know about the other one. It's been through quality and through audit. Are there any people who would like to ask any additional questions that haven't already been answered? I'm going to pause for a moment. No. Um, are people in agreement that we can approve these, uh, the annual governance statement and the self-certification of compliance and provide a licence and the annual report subject to the audit committee giving final sign-off to it. Yeah. All three, yes. yes. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, uh, I know these things, and thank you to the team that have put all of that together. I know it's a lot of work. Thank you. Um, so that takes us to finance and the draft annual financial account, which is also extremely important. Lorraine first. <coughs> That, thank you, Chair. So um, I think what I'll do is uh, we, we have the, the draft annual accounts and the month 12 um, financial report. So what I'll just do is um, give the uh, summary of the, the, the results um, as context um, and then uh, come, come to the uh, annual accounts uh, uh, request for, for the board. The, um, so as I highlighted earlier, um, we have met our statutory financial duties for 2021 subject to the uh, final audit. Uh, I just want to sort of draw out sort of uh, the key, um, key results. So we uh, ended the year with a surplus of 1.2 million uh, and our turnover was 567 million. Um, that um, is all um, aligned with the target position agreed with Northwest London um, ICS. Um, I think it's also um, you know, worth noting uh, actually how much uh, additional funding has come through to support COVID. Um, so we uh, ha spent a, a total of 88.4 million uh, on, on COVID, the COVID response. Um, in fact, some of that uh, expense was, was centrally covered um, through the, the central um, procurement. So you'll see some numbers um, in the annual report uh, 
report on 85.8 million, but they are um, they are the same. The um, and as part of that, recognising that that contained a, a significant uh, element of our our surge um, requirements uh, for the sec to meet the second uh, the second wave. Um, We've talked about the capital plan, and I think it is, again, worth reflecting that the closing capital expenditure for last year was uh, double the sort of the level of, the, of previous years. Um, and we spent the total CRL that we were afforded, um, and we could have spent more. Um, so uh, we spent 43 million. And I think um, we probably haven't sort of flagged, and uh, I'm sure we will for the for the annual um, general meeting, but there, there are a significant number of really critical infrastructure um, um, projects uh, that have been in plan for some time that we've actually been able to, uh, to get uh, uh, started. Um, and that is all on the back of the, of the original response that we um, needed to do at great pace um, with our immediate um, COVID response. And that is across um, our digital uh, infrastructure, telephony, estate, fleet, uh, and um, our investment in our patient care records. So I don't think there's any aspect of our physical estate that has, hasn't been touched by this. Um, but it is an enormous opportunity now to sort of um, continue and, and, and complete that. Um, the, um, we also should note that we have um, a strong cash balance at the end of the year. Um, but just to note that we don't sit on cash. Um, this is uh, slightly skewed um, by the phasing of the capital program and um, accrued expenditure. So we do expect that to reverse out um, in, the, in this financial year. Uh, and then finally, just to note that um, as part of uh, sort of good practice of supply, uh, supply um, support, um, the government has uh, what's called a better payment practice code, um, which requires uh, government bodies to pay uh, their supplier invoices within um, 30 days. And um, we have maintained that, um, uh, the, the, the performance that we um, improved upon last year. We were the slight dip, I think, in, in uh, the last month. And again, it, it's just a, a, a function of the, the sheer number of, um, of invoices that were processed um, in the delivery of our capital programme. And then... Um, as I've alluded to, um, uh, we, we have been under a, uh, a block allocation, um, and uh, that is now uh, that was uh, set for the second half of um, uh, well, sorry, the first half of uh, 2021. We had the suspension of the um, planning and 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 SIP. Uh, this is the the efficiency programs in recognition of the uh, the need to really focus on our response. But I just want to note that um, as part of the second half of the 2021 position, uh, we um, were asked to set a, a target um, to, uh, to support the efficiency. And in fact, we did overachieve <coughs> on that um, and with a full year achievement of, a, of an 8.3 million um, efficiency program. Uh, so I think, again, just to sort of note that uh, we haven't sort of let all of the, sort of the normal business um, sort of processes um, um, uh, stand down, and part of those uh, actually were um, one. I think one to flag <coughs> is that we uh, were able to negotiate some free fuel on the back of the COVID, which actually was a benefit to uh, the wider um, the wider NHS. So I think I just um, uh, that's the sort of the the results, if you like, um, which cover then the. Um, the financial statements that we um, have before us. Uh, as I say, uh, Rommel has already um, uh, presented the, the, the context for this. Um, the Audit Committee has reviewed uh, these annual accounts and um, uh, uh, Rommel may want to, um, to say something, but I think we are recommending um, the delegation of the final approval um, of these accounts. Um, I think the only other thing uh, to to note is that um, we do have to consider the um, whether these uh, accounts are presented on a going concern basis. And I think just to to flag that um, 
the there's a sort of um, a, a national um, sort of guide on this that um, uh, this is about um, the continuity. The, we know only need to look at the continuity of service aspect um, uh, as opposed to I think we did we did a, quite a thorough um, sort of two year sort of cash flow. Um, in the previous year, but just to note that um, there's a sort of national um, guide for auditors um, that doesn't require that. Um, but we are recommending and have the audit committee have ag agreed that it is uh, correct to prepare these accounts on going concern basis. Thank you. Rommel, would you like to add? Yeah, just a couple of things, if I may. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to note that the audit committee did review the accounts with finance before the draft submission to NHSI on the 27th of April. So we've had one go through the numbers. What I have asked for is just a movement analysis between then and whatever we're going to see at the audit committee on the 27th. And if anything else changes between then and the 10th of June. So we'll keep, keep an eye on anything else that might move, but I'm not hearing any material changes to what Lorraine has just taken you through. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, subject to final auditing of the accounts, the audit committee, um, are we happy to approve um, these, um, the annual financial accounts? Yes, and that will be delegated then for Lorraine and um, the sign off with Gara. Yep, thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. But there's some good things to note in the uh, year, although I think we must note the amount of COVID, potentially non-recurrent money we've had and the impact on that and our deliverability of services can't be underestimated, I think. Thank you. So, annual account, John. Oh, so, the quality account, yep. So, um, quality account, big yeah. button. Yeah. Uh, so, we have a statutory responsibility to complete the quality account. It's... Uh, uh, be compiled, as Mark uh, outlined earlier, and being for the Quality Assurance Committee, we've outlined uh, 18 priorities last year, of which 17 we've made significant progress on. Mm -hmm. uh, one was in relation to the uh, putting in of Tempus, as a specific piece of equipment, into the motorcycle response unit. So that's the one that we haven't made progress mm -hmm. on because of COVID. Um, uh, we've proposed 10 priorities for this coming year that you'll find uh, within that report. So uh, much like the report we've just heard there. The ask here is that this is approved to, uh, on, on a content basis, there will be some, some tidying up before it's published at the end of June to meet the, the timeframes. Thank you. Mark, did you want to add anything? No. Or Fenella? No. Okay, so I'll be happy to approve the quality account with a few minor tidyings up and note the 10 priorities. Thank you very much. Well done. That takes us to the system oversight framework and the LAS response. Are we having Angela for this? Or uh, I think I can hopefully take I this. Think gone <laughs> yeah. um, so obviously Angela Flirty now reports directly into me as uh, Associate Director for uh, Strategy and Transformation following Ross Fullerton's departure and has prepared this uh, consultation response and consultation with myself and Heather presented here for the board uh, for, for noting uh, the response really is uh, in line with our uh, response earlier in the year to the ICS consultation and our position around uh, the uh, the gaps in the uh, the, the, the framework uh, as it's currently laid out uh, for regional providers. So hopefully uh, the responses in the consultation, which is fairly short, uh, reflect our position there in supportive of the overall principles, but recognising that there are gaps that need to be filled in the way that organisations like ourselves are uh, linked into the system going forward. Thank you. Um, are there any comments on that? It really all relates back to how we relate to ICSs, I think, yeah. at the end of the day. Romley, is that a hand up or not? I can't quite see. No, no. Any comments on that? Or are we just noting our position? Noting it. Thank you very much. Um, that takes us on to the draft annual... No, it doesn't. It takes us on to beg your pardon, Port Assurance, Tricia. In back risk. Okay, so just to note, there are no changes in the BAF risk, but just to update you on BAF risk 58, which was discussed at the Financial Investment Committee on the 13th of May. This is in relation to whether or not we spend the £100,000 on um, improving the BOW infrastructure, IT infrastructure, in the context of moving to Newham in September. 
So the board asked for more information to be provided and they will be reporting that back to the board in July. Two other risks um, that have been noted during the meeting uh, were discussed at the, on the 13th of May and that's the capital versus transformation programme which is under discussion and will also be brought back to the board in July. And the third one again been mentioned earlier which is the hub one and how we're going to deliver that, the governance, et cetera, which again is under discussion at the Logistics and Infrastructure Committee, as Sheila pointed out earlier, and that will come back to the board. So no change overall, but three still in progress and being looked at currently. Okay. So this is important uh, material. Are there any comments or anything people need to uh, relate? Do people agree, understand and approve that? So we're going to come back to it, but the risks, the bath risks remain as is, with Sheila's. some... Pardon? Sheila's got... Oh, Sheila, sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry, Chair, just on the, um, just on that, that last point around the, uh, the hub one, I, I think that's related to the risk I pointed out earlier yeah. around the people and culture change. It's, it's mm. not so much about hub one, it's, it's much bigger. Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's about the entirety of our programme of change, um, Tricia, so just... Yeah. Okay, I will note that, Sheila. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sheila, okay. Yes. I, I think I'm kind of seized by what what Sheila's saying and what you've said that that there is a there is perhaps something we need to draw together here about the longer term transformation agenda because yes, it's around physical delivery of infrastructure or whatever. Yes, it's around uh, culture, but yes, it's also it's also around uh, capital. Uh, you know, we, you know we won't be able to deliver uh, on this transformation agenda if we don't get all of those things. So maybe it's, maybe uh, can I ask that you perhaps ask the executive to go away and look at a more generic review uh, risk around transformation. And I think we haven't actually uh, yet picked up on the sort of the normalizing, if you like, of, of, of the COVID risk, uh, which we did suggest that we would do. We're still looking at that from a, um, uh, you know, a, a committee by committee cumulative uh, approach, and I think we said that we'd like to move over time to, to normalising the the outstanding risks, like for instance the ones we've discovered yeah. you've discussed around staffing and, and so on, uh, sure. as as we move more into a uh, a living with a post COVID world environment. I mean, if the exec consider that, and then I think that's the work to take forward with Rommel and Shield to say how does that all come together so that we can be assured. Yeah. But it is a fundamental yeah. thing, not yeah. having, yeah. you know, what staff always don't like, like is lots of initiatives. And I think it's yeah. one initiative with strands which yeah. say, how do we involve them? What is the journey we're on? And clarity of simple messages, but they need to understand the constraints. Too. I think that's absolutely, yeah. otherwise we, we, we're going to risk ending up with a, a bath with rather too many yeah. individual items on it when actually <laughs> we're talking about three or four big things here. Okay, that can be done. Thank you. Um, do we need to talk any more about the risks underlying that um, that Helen's prepared, Tricia? Is there anything you want to point out from there? Um, no. No. So people have looked at those and are content. The important thing is to make sure that they shift and don't stay static. So I'm looking to John Fenella and um, Mark in particular for those. But thank you very much. So we're asked to approve the board assurance framework and that we will further discuss risks uh, in respect of capital at the SIC and the LIC with Hub 1, but also taking on your point, we need to review it overall. So we're sort of modifying that to saying, let's take it a more strategic and holistic approach to those reviews and to come back to the July board. Thank you. So I think before we close, it's time for a brief review. We have covered a lot today. So I think I'm going to start with the um, formal reports that we have approved, which is the annual report uh, subject to modifications, the annual governance statement of compliance and provide a licence noting the issue that's recently been raised and the self-certification. We've approved subject to the audit committee um, last analysis of the draft annual financial account um, and give delegated responsibility, as I say, to the audit committee. We've approved the annual quality account and look for a few more, I think, milestones is what we talked about. 
We've looked at areas of good practice, and I think it's really important for uh, the executive to take that back to the staff, particularly around logistics and the change management led by engaging staff by Andrew Goodman, the D999 programme and Stuart and the team that we would like to write to, and perhaps we should write to Andrew too. We've noted that we want to take those sort of changes forward in a more systematic way across the organisation. Um, and we've, um, I can't see what my last one said, but somebody might remind me in a minute. But we've also identified some risks around capital. At the moment, we only have roughly half of what we need, and there needs to be some reprioritisation, noting that the D999 programme and IT infrastructure work is an enabler of the other changes that we want to make. We have some significant issues about staffing that we need to come back on, making sure that we haven't an over-reliance on the fact that there is more retention than normal because of COVID, and there is a risk there. Um, we've also noted in finance we had over 80 million of um, COVID money, which could be considered non-recurrent, so we have to manage that risk. But on the plus side, we have agreed the Q1 and 2 uh, finance this year, which is good with some identif identification of CIPs, but just to note, the executive are going to make sure the non-execs get the detail of those. Um, and we're awaiting the IUC um, deadlines of when we're going to do that. So we've got significant assurance. We've heard from the subcommittees, but I think I have summarised most of those risks there. Um, does anybody want to add to that? And shall we take a few minutes then to review how the meeting has gone from your perspective? And I could ask, are there any questions from the members of the public that have been dialing in at this stage, Sam? No. OK. So um, I think that's... Anybody want to add to my summary? What did I miss out? Nothing the, at the... The only on. thing you missed out... I think was you know reporting to the board the work that we've done in the development board around strategic refresh and reset. And yes, and sorry. That's important it was an important thing to bring to the main board. That Thank you for that correction. So we did bring the refresh mm -hmm. and how we're going to take three strands of work. Just to remind people, what's the story for our staff? How do we yeah. co-produce it? How do we align? Um, all these pieces of work, and then what's the transformation? So we do one piece of work, and the third one was the strategy refresh. Thank you. So um, how was the meeting for you? It's a bit... For those of you on screen, you're a bit long distance to me. I know that colleagues in the room can see you behind me, which is easier, so I hope I've managed to pick up your questions. Um, anything anybody wants to say about the meeting? What went well? What could we do better? Jill? Uh, felt very well structured, very organised. I thought there was some nice recognition as we went through the board meeting for a lot of the work that's been done by a number of the members of the board. Um, and um, I felt we were a little bit more efficient than the last time we had this board meeting. Good, thank you. I think, can I just add by way of a question? I think, you know, for me, this is something approaching where, we, as an exec, we think we'd like to take the management and delivery of future board meetings in terms of the layout, the technology, uh, and so on. So I think, you know, very much open to feedback as to whether this is this is the right way to do things. I think, you know, we talked about ways of working uh, earlier um, uh, and ways of working around the board table as well as actually around the exec table that we were talking about yesterday. I think we're still feeling our way as to the, the right way to do things. So I'm, I'd be particularly keen to take feedback on, okay. uh, on how the mechanics of, uh, of doing meetings in this way slightly more real with people in the room, but still making use of the technology that we've all learned to, uh, uh, not to use. You mm. know, potentially, for instance, if we, if we want uh, uh, to have a, a non-executive team uh, officers you know, presenting reports or reporting, mm. my suggestion mm. would be that we don't necessarily need to uh, drag them into the room uh, to do that, but they potentially can do that on a screen uh, effectively and, and things like that. So really kind of... Mm -hmm open to, to, feedback to for, on that. for feedback. Okay. Rommel, did you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to recognise, I think this has worked really well, and, and hybrid working, I think, is going to be the way of working going forward. So there is real value in us coming together face-to-face, -face, and I think we should do that on a regular basis, but it doesn't have to be at every meeting. 
And so I think this kind of mixed model uh, really seems to work very well. And I just ask that we try and take it forward. Okay, thank you. And how we covered the integrated performance report, did that work for you? I didn't get it quite right at the beginning, I apologise. Uh, but did we have enough time to talk about it or were there areas that we didn't get into? What's the view? It still took us quite a lot of time. We've caught up. Amit, did you want to? I actually, I actually think it worked well. Maybe we should just allot it a bit more time because I think actually it's quite a good structured way of going through the major areas of the trust business. I think having a combination of the sort of director report and assurance report and then questions um, worked well. Maybe we just need to allot them 15 More minutes, time. 10 minutes slots, for instance, so that, because it, it, you know we do get through a lot of the business of the organisation, I think. Personally, I felt rushed, but um, Vic, could I ask you, Trisha, take that, see if we can do the timing a bit more. Okay, thank you. I mean, Anne, as a new person coming to the board, do you have any feedback? You can say what you like. No, I thought it, I thought it was very, very structured. I mean, from my perspective, I'd rather be in, in the room, but then that's yeah. just, just just me. But I agree with a, a, a mixed economy. Mm. Um, there was a huge amount in the integrated performance report. Mm. So I think probably could spend more time on that because there was a lot of things there that you could have had a good conversation about. Um, so for me, I guess as a new BB, still just thinking, well, what are the <laughs> key things to pull out as distinct from everything? Yeah. yeah. I think it is a challenge because as a board, we're meant to be strategic, but oversight and getting that balance right. And clearly on the annual report cycle, there's a lot of yeah. the governance bit, but I'll take that back. Um, anything else anybody would like to add? No. So I think, uh, firstly, a final thank you to Jane. We will miss you. I'm sure we'll keep in touch. Um, look forward to that. Thank you for all you've done to, uh, for us. Um, and best wishes from us all. And we hope to be able to get together at some point. Yes, uh, Trisha's giving you a virtual clap. I think that's very nice. So um, we haven't quite got the music uh, lined up to do like the Oscars or even the VIP awards. Apologies for that. Perhaps we can think about that. Watch out, I've probably got it over in the back from the VIP awards we did a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yes, that's what I was thinking. Okay, so thank you. Um, I think just before I close the meeting, I think Jane, we don't have you or Rommel this afternoon. Is that right? So if there's anything when we have closed the meeting you want to raise subsequently that you haven't already raised, please do. Um, and we do have a Remco later. Is it the case we don't have either of you for that? But we've had your comments. Yep. Thank you. So I think that brings me then to uh, closing the meeting of our meeting being held in public. Thank you to people who are listening or watching us live streaming and to the board and particularly to the executives. Thank you very much.